What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. According to recent numbers released from the CDC, about one in four of today's high school students identify as LGBTQ. This presents a tremendous urgency for parents, pastors, and educators, and mentors to know how to love and support teens who wrestle with these issues, and also to equip Christian teens to engage with their struggling peers in love and in truth. I'm your host, Helen Todd. A couple of episodes ago, I had a very interesting interview with Kathy Grace Duncan, who lived as a man for 11 years before Jesus touched the deep wounds in her heart and she embraced her original gender and identity. If you have not listened to it, I highly recommend it. You can find it in the previous episodes. It is titled Faith, Gender Identity, and Transformation. This episode is a follow-up as I pondered Kathy Grace's story and thought how her life could have been different if someone reached out to her while she was still a struggling teen. My guest today is Greg Steer, founder of Dare to Share Ministry. That's Dare Number 2 Share. His main goal is to train teens to be passionate evangelists of their faith. He shares four key principles that equip teens with the loving and compassionate framework to be ambassadors for Christ to their confused peers. And as I listened to him, I found these four key principles very useful, not just for teens, but really for anyone who has a heart for the hurting and broken people, regardless of what their struggle is. Hello, Greg. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You joining us from Denver. How? What is the weather like today in Denver? It's hot. It's 90. I think it's going to be in the 90s today. Oh, so, wow. Well, yeah. that's it's about not, to change, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not humid, though. So that's Denver's very dry. That's uh, the climate. big difference between you and Missouri today. Exactly. We are humid, definitely. I'm very excited about our conversation because it's sort of a follow-up to my previous interview, and I feel like this is uh, the subject is so important that it deserves, at the very least, two episodes. So I read statistics somewhere that today, one in four high school students identify as LGBTQ. Have you heard the same numbers? Yeah, I mean, that's according to the CDC. And again, I think the key is identify as. I don't necessarily think one in four teenagers are actually that, but, you know, a lot of kids are identifying. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of the thing now that is, you know, just sweeping the nation in, in many ways. Uh, all of a sudden, it's very accepted to I, identify as uh, LGBTQ. And um, yeah. You know, I have two sons, and uh, they are nine years apart, so that's almost a generation. <laughs> and uh, I, I am observing, so my youngest one is a, a senior in high school, and so the difference that I'm observing in the culture and the atmosphere is huge, you know, with these nine years uh, apart. And so what struck me, I was at a school play, and I realized that a good number of kids in that play, I could not determine what gender they were. So it's almost like um, it's kind of like a androgynous style. And I don't know if that comes under that umbrella, but it's almost like it's not cool to look any gender anymore. Would you agree with that? Well, I think, and you know, with, with some students, you know, that's, that's definitely the case. Um, I, you know, I just think, you know, when you get down to it, it comes down to a misunderstanding of Genesis 1 and 2. I mean, I think a lot of the problems this generation is facing is, is 
they do not understand God's design. And, you know, most of them don't accept the Bible as their standard of authority. And so what's being set as a standard of authority is kind of cultural norms and feelings. And boy, when that becomes your standard of authority, everything gets mushy. It's like building your house on oatmeal instead of cement. And I think that's exactly what's happening. So, you know, I wrote a blog uh, called Love and Truth that really kind of helped identify and clarify, you know, what should our stance as believers be, and specifically youth leaders and parents dealing with their teenagers uh, over these questions of sexuality and gender. And so I try to do it in a, in a loving way, in a caring way, but also based on truth. I, I believe, uh, Helen, that we can be 100% truthful and 100% loving, that we, we, um, we can speak the truth in love. And that we need to. And I, I actually, I feel sorry for this generation. I feel sorry for a lot of those that are involved in LGBTQ that are just confused and they're not hearing a clear voice from scripture. And if they are, they may be hearing a non-loving voice from believers. And so I, I think we need to speak the truth in absolute love. We need to equip our teens not to back down, but not to be jerks and to be loving and kind and lay the gospel out and talk about, you know, God's design for sexuality, but do it in a way that's compelling, that's winsome, but that doesn't shrink back in fear. So that's why I called the article Love and Truth. And this is precisely what I want us to talk about. And in my previous interview, where I interviewed Kathy Grace Duncan, who shared her story of coming out of the transgender lifestyle, my main point was how, as a church, do we reach out to people who are confused about their gender or sexuality with love and with truth? That's a very fine line and, and a fine balance, I feel like, especially in today's culture that is very inflamed. And so when it comes to teenagers, that becomes even more sensitive. And so that's that's what I would like for us to accomplish. I, I feel like the generation, the, the youth, the teenagers of today, they're kind overall. You know, I think that they, even those who understand the biblical truths about gender, and sexuality, they're very accepting of their peers who are, you know, who who don't have the same foundation. And so it almost is to the point of, well, you live your life, I live my life. And, you know, that's, that's yeah, how you, it goes. The, what everybody says, you do you. And I'm like, yeah, that's the worst. That's what basically the serpent told Eve, you know, and... It's not good advice. You do you because that, that will lead to a spiral. And so, you know, it's interesting because loving and kind, sometimes, you know, love actually love speaks the truth and not sometimes love speaks the truth. You know, if you see a little kid running toward traffic, you're going to yell at them. You're going to speak the truth, not because you hate that kid, but because you love that kid. You don't want to see that kid get hurt. And so Jesus was ultimately loving. Matter of fact, that's the that's the first point. I think we just if you with your permission just dive right in. How how do we help our teens wrestle through and think through these issues of gender and sexuality when we're when we're really helping our Christian teens to think biblically about this and act Christ-like in these areas. There's four powerful scriptural truths. Number 1 is choose love not hate as your posture. Whenever I see Christians with picket signs that depict hate toward those of, you know, who are struggling with these issues, it breaks my heart. First John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I mean, the most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. He didn't qualify it or quantify it. He loves the world and everyone in it. Gay, straight, transgender, everyone. God is love. That's who he is. And that, you know, we need to really make sure that's our posture toward everyone. They are not our enemy. They are victims of the enemy. They're held captive 
by Satan. And we as believers in Christ must have our hearts broken for those who are stuck in these lifestyles and do what we can to rescue them out of love. And I think that's the first and most important point to begin with is, you know, love, not hate must be our posture. So how do we express love? What are some practical way practical ways of expressing love? I think for one is proximity. I I think we need to, you know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, yesterday there was a guy I walked into to get my hair cut and he told me, he's like, I, I was raised Jehovah's Witness. I, I'm gay. I didn't get baptized because I wouldn't be accepted and I would be kicked out. And I just listened to him. You know, I didn't ask for, hey, can you give me the, can you, can I give, can you give me the straight barber here? No, I sat there and I got to know Joey and we talked and I was able to, you know, walk through the gospel with them. I wrote a book called Unlikely Fighter that tells my whole story of radical transformation. I said, if I give you one, will you read it? And he goes, yeah. So after this, podcast, I'm going over there and I'm going to write a note in there and give it to him and give him my business card and say, hey, after you read this talk, give me a call, tell me what you think or text me. So just being in proximity and being loving and having conversations and giving eye contact and, you know, treating everybody as individuals, image bearers in spite of their sin, because we have sin too. It's just maybe a different, you know, type of sin, but sin is sin. So I think being in proximity, if you have gay neighbors, gay coworkers, transgender students that your kids go to school with, talking to them, engaging with them, not avoiding them, you know, not taking out your cootie spray and spraying it, but loving them and treating them like an individual. How did Jesus treat the woman at the well? I mean, he he talked to her, which was a, I mean, that was a radical thing. He was talking to a woman, which Jew, Jewish men didn't talk to Jewish women, let you know, let alone Samaritan women, who were half half Jew and half Gentile. They were considered less than dogs by many Jews. And Jesus right. engaged in our conversation. You know, he so was just, intentional about it. You know, he knew perfectly well who she is, and he also knew perfectly well how culturally unacceptable it was for him as a man and as a Jew to speak to her, but he was intentional about it. And I think in our culture, it's really easy to keep these separate paths, you know, for students in school, I hang out with my friends, you hang out with yours, our paths don't really cross, even if we sit in the same classes. But I think being intentional would be the first step in showing love, knowing that the reason this person is in that confusion is because of pain that they're living out or carrying and being intentional about showing that you care, showing that you're interested in their life. Exactly. And I mean, just just common courtesy and kindness. And so I, I think that's the first thing. That's the first stance. The second one is choose the Bible, not culture, as your authority. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all scripture is God-breathed. The way I explain this to teenagers is God's word is inspired. It's breathed out by God. Therefore, it's inerrant. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. It's inerrant. It's without errors. In its original manuscripts, we can trust it in areas of life and faith and sexuality and gender. So it's, it, it's, it's inspired. It's iner- inerrant. Therefore, it's in charge. You know, it's what I call house rules. It's what I told my kids growing up. You know, he who owns a house makes the rules. Your mom and I own this house. We make the rules in this house. Well, God owns the house called the universe and everything in it right? The, 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 earth, the earth is the Lord, the universe is the Lord's and everything in it. So he makes the rules. So we need to understand God is very clear. I, you know, people get into these debates about what well, does God really condemn homosexuality? And, you know, he also in the same passage in Leviticus where he condemned homosexuality, condemns eating shellfish. And, you know, I mean, these ridiculous arguments, it's obviously there's moral laws and there's civil laws uh, and there's different laws. Uh, and that's a moral law because we see it equivalent of that in Romans 1 when it talks about homosexuality being a sin. You know, it's, it's, the acts are shameful. It makes it very clear. Not, not, you know, not, it doesn't even back off on that. It's very clear in scripture where that is at. So I think we need to really look to scripture as our authority. We see homosexuality 
as clearly identified as a sin in Scripture, and we we don't need to back down on that. And I I know there's there's you know what, what people call same sex attraction and different things like that. There, and I think there's a difference be, between struggling with that attraction and and classifying yourself as a homosexual. You know, I know there's believers who have struggled with same-sex attraction and and have to live, you know, seek to live that holy life that pleases God and rivet their minds to Him. But it all comes from scriptural authority. The Bible's very clear on this, and we need to help our students understand how clear the Bible is. And it's also clear on identity. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. So they, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. And it says, uh, so God created mankind in his own image. He created them male and female. He created them. So he created a male and a female. And, and that's very clear from the first chapter of the Bible all the way through. So I just think we need to really help our students understand that the Bible is clear on these issues and that God, before the foundation of the earth, determined our gender and and what we would be. He formed us, Psalm 139, knit us together in our mother's womb. Jeremiah 1.5, he tells Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So you are designed by God as, you know, a, a male or female, and you are des- you are designed by God to live in a you know, either be single or live in a heterosexual relationship in the context of marriage. That's what. Well, that's and what here I think for. for many pro for many teenagers, this this is in direct conflict with what they're being taught sometimes in school within the public school curriculum. And so I think the great responsibility is on parents, the youth pastors, to really, you know, establish that very firm foundation um, in their mind, even probably earlier than they become teenagers, because they have to, at, at that age, they're starting to figure out who they are. They're kind of pursuing the more independent way of thinking. So that foundation really should start even before so that they have something to lean on. And so I think that your ministry, that's precisely the focus of your ministry there to share is to give the youth, the teenagers, that solid foundation to be able to not only establish for themselves what the truth is, but be able to share that truth with others. So I want to come back to that and talk a little bit more what you do within there to share organization. But let's go jump into the third principle. And I think this is a very important one where we need to choose the gospel and not sin management for solutions because it's very easy when you have the biblical foundation to fall into this trap of well let me just tell you how how it is <laughs> so what what how do you outline that solution well the gospel i mean it is it is the solution you know people talk about reparative therapy and all this other stuff i'm like Man, you know what? I, I don't need reparative therapy. I need transformation. You know, spiritually dead brought back to life. Romans one sixteen says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So it's not a matter of, well, let me try to tell you, you know, how you can manage this sin. It's going back to the cross. It's going back and believing that, you know, I, I dare to share, we use a simple gospel acrostic. God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Everyone who trusts in him alone is eternal life, and life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. And that gospel message transforms us. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything is becoming new. And so what does Paul do in 1 Corinthians 6 when he's talking to the Corinthians who were stuck in all sorts of crazy sins. There were divisions among them. People were getting drunk at the communion table. There was sexual immorality. All sorts. I mean, just talk about crazy. The Corinthians is like, man, it's like going to Vegas every Sunday. They were just, they just had a lot of sins. What does Paul say? He said, listen, remember that those who sin, those who are adulterers, liars, cheaters, homosexual offenders, will not inherit the kingdom of God. He makes this whole list. 
And some of the Corinthians lived, were living out that list. But then he says in the next verse, but that's what some of you were. But now you've been washed, you've been justified, you've been sanctified. So even though they were still struggling with some of that stuff, what does he do? He takes them back to the gospel. He said, that's not who you are anymore. You've been made a new creation. Walk in that. Keep your eyes on who your new identity in Christ. So it all goes back to the gospel, not just when it comes to seeing an unsaved, gay or straight or transgender person coming to Christ, but to see all of us, gay, straight, growing in Christ and freeing ourselves from those sins, because now we have a new identity. It's not gay or straight or transgender. It's child of God. And so the gospel transforms that identity. And I think it's so, so important to get back to the gospel, continue to go to the gospel, relentlessly go to the gospel, and let the gospel of Christ that saves you by faith alone and what he did for us on the cross transform you by that ongoing faith from first to last. In the end, you know, we all struggle from some form of sin, from some desires of our flesh that are not pleasing to God. And it's a matter of there is no way that we can conquer it unless we choose God more, that we love God more than we love our flesh. And that principle applies to any any sin or or weakness that we may have in our lives. And that's the only, I've seen so many examples of this, you know, a, a real successful rehabilitation program like a drug or alcohol addiction based on nothing but just the scripture and 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 transforming people's lives through the gospel message and phenomenal success rates compared to government programs that have medical treatments, you know, and and really don't get anywhere. Let me just affirm that. So, I have partners in Africa who are mobilizing for the gospel. And now some of them are government funded because the problems of AIDS and struggles and poverty, they are taking a gospel approach to these solutions. And now many of these governments are actually funding some of their ministries because the powers in the gospel that change lives. You know, we always think, well, you know, well, it, you know, they just, we just need to give them this, this, and this, and everything's going to be fixed. But what trans when you're transformed from the heart you're not you when i was raised in a in a poor family and by a single mom in an inner city violent setting and when i heard the gospel i felt like the richest kid on the block we struggled to get our next meal i felt wealthy because the gospel changes everything and i think we need to really remember that when it comes to mobilizing our young people to reach the LGBTQ peers with the hope of Christ. And then to see them transform, believe that that same gospel, that same Holy Spirit that now dwells inside of them. And I think, you know, there's this thought, well, you got to stop being gay before you come to Christ. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's like saying you got to get cleaned up to take a bath. <laughs> right. You get you get saved. Like people say, we well, got to turn from your sin first and then come to Christ. I'm like, well, I thought the whole point of coming to Christ is that he turns us from our sin. We don't turn ourselves from our sin. We can save ourselves if we could turn ourselves from our sin. We cannot turn ourselves from our sin. We come as sinners unable to turn from our sin, put our faith in Christ, and then he transforms us and begins that process of turning us from our sin, sanctifying us, conforming us to the image of Christ. So my solution is this, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel changes everything. You know, Thoreau once said that you're going to love this quote, for every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, one strikes at the root. Only the gospel strikes at the root of evil. I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, before we jump into the fourth principle, I want to ask you, what would you say? Because I know people personally who struggle, um, you know, with, with homosexuality, and they do know the truth. And I believe that they do love the Lord, but the, the breakthrough has not happened, at least not yet. And my heart goes out and, and, you know, at some point you just feel helpless to help the person because at this point they, they know the truth, they know the message, they have, seemingly receive the message and believe it, but the breakthrough is not there. So what would you say to people who are in that situation? 
I, I would say the breakthrough is not optional. So in other words, when, when you get saved, you, you're the child of God. He says in Philippians 1, 6, the good work he began in you, he will complete into the day of Christ Jesus. Some of the Corinthians resisted the process of sanctification. 1 Corinthians 11, I think 30, it says, for this cause, many of you are weak and sick and many of you fall asleep. Now that's talking about the dirt nap. It's talking about death. So God will push that easy button of sanctification if he has to. The easy button is welcome home, right? Okay. Yeah. We have to continue to fight the good fight. And if we don't, I think as a church, and it doesn't matter what the sin is, it could be gossip. It could be slander. It could be alcoholism. It could be homosexuality. If the only sin that people get kicked out of the church for is a refusal to repent. That's it. it and it, 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 when you refuse to stop trying to fight the good fight, is when church discipline should take place in first, you read in first Corinthians five. And so <clears throat> I really think that we need to, we need to do everything we can to help people walk in that victory. And we need to take this area, this area and, and all sin seriously. You know, people get all nervous, you know, to, there's, you know, somebody who's a drag queen reading, you know, at a library to children. Okay. Yes. Very inappropriate, but we don't mind if a gossip teaches Sunday school to our eight year old children. There are Sunday school teachers that gossips all the time. I'm like, okay, we need to deal with that sin too. I mean, that's that's wrong. And so I I think we need we need to really help people take sin seriously and realize help them realize this is not your new identity. And if whatever that sin category is, if they refuse to stop trying to walk in victory, now we need to go to the church, now the elders, and and try to figure that out uh, on a church wide level, not out of hate, but out of love as a last ditch effort for sanctification in the life of that that person that's struggling with what that's that's refused to struggle with that sin anymore in other words they're they're not they're not fighting a good fight to walk in victory over that so let's uh let's jump into the fourth principle and that is choose engagement not detachment so we touched a little bit on this in the beginning, talking about that love is intentional. We choose to reach out. But what can you add to this as we speak about this fourth, fourth principle? Well, well, we need to mobilize our students to, to reach out to their friends that are struggling with these issues with the hope of Christ and to share the gospel with them. You know, I think of my son. He had a friend that you actually went to Christian school with. She came out of the closet and, you know, got kicked out of the school, got really bitter toward God, became an atheist. Well, Jeremy just kept building a relationship with her and just kept talking to her, kept hanging out with her, you know. I normally wouldn't let Jeremy, you know, go hang out at a girl's house, but she was, honestly, she was lesbian. So I was like, you know, like, you know go for it. He's trying to reach her, reach her back for Christ. And so he, he and I, I was doing a, an event where I had a speak on this issue. So I said, do you think your friend would be open to let me interview her about making sure I'm saying everything right? And so we, Jeremy and, and his friend and I met at a Starbucks. I went over my sermon with her and she was like, yeah, maybe say it this way. She was very helpful actually. And when Jeremy used the restroom, I said to her, I said, is there anything that would turn you back to God? And she said, you know, just so you know, your son, Jeremy is doing a good job. He's moved me from being an atheist to being an agnostic. Now I'm kind of reconsidering because I'm realizing, and he's, I know where he stands on this issue, but he loves me and he cares about me and he's pointing me to Christ. And so I thought, man, that's what we need to do. We don't detach, we engage. What did Jesus do? He got a, you know, he was hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. What's the modern day equivalent of that? I think it'd be the LGBT community, at least as part of that, that Jesus was hanging out with and bringing hope to not, not affirming their sin, but, but loving them as individuals and sharing the way out of this lifestyle and the way out of sin in general. And that is through the gospel. So I think we need to mobilize our teenagers on our campuses as federally funded missionaries that share the gospel, live the gospel and love everybody and do not back down on these issues. Well, and I believe this is the mission of 
your ministry there to share is to mobilize the teenagers, the young people to be the ambassadors for Christ. So what are some of the ways that you accomplish this? Yeah, so every year we do an event called Dare to Share Live, and it is a day of evangelism, inspiration, and equipping. It's November 11th, and we provide the video training. We provide the app. It's And then everybody gets trained, equipped, inspired, and they go out to their own communities and share the gospel. They engage their friends with their smartphones. Our app, Life in Six Words, they're able to see kind of an Instagram feed of gospel conversations that are happening from around the world and all these youth groups from around the world. It'll start in New Zealand and Australia on November 11th. And as the sun goes around the world, literally we have a map that lights up when there's gospel conversations taking place on the app. So I believe that the, the, as the sun goes around the world, the, the map on the app will light up in tens of thousands of gospel conversations on November 11th. And it's high quality. It's well done. There's drama. There's interaction. And it's absolutely free. So made possible by the generosity of our donors. It's not free to us. This thing costs a lot to pull off well, uh, but it's high, high quality. So people can find out more about it at daretoshare.live.org. That's the number two, dare to share live, L-I-V-E dot O-R-G, dare to share live.org. And just sign up and you can do it as a youth leader. You can do it with your youth group. If you're a parent, you can have, you know, if teenagers, you can have them and their friends come to your house and just show it there. And but you got to go out and share Christ as part of it. That's what makes Dare to Share Live work. And last year we had almost 2,000 churches across the world registered for it. Uh, this year, we believe there's going to be, you know, thousands more. This sounds super equipped. exciting, Greg, and I'm going to post the link uh, to this in the show notes so that our listeners could join um, or share with uh, their teens, their youth, um, how to join. Um, I know that you offer a number of resources on your website as well. One of them particularly is called Hard Questions, Examining Gender, Sexuality, and Identity through the gospel so and they're all free as well what are some of the hard questions that you're addressing in these resources basically take that love and truth article that i wrote and we each of them is basically an individual youth group session so we talk about love and truth we talk about the bible as authority we talk about what scripture has to say about those issues we talk about identity and how our identity is found in christ and we talk about engagement how do you reach your Friends with Christ. So it's a free four week, four part curriculum series designed for youth leaders or parents to use with their teenagers. So, yeah, that's on dare to share.org. Again, the number two, dare to share.org under curriculum and resources and tons of free stuff available to help youth leaders and parents navigate this crazy world that we live in with the power of the gospel. I think it's time, Helen, I think it's time to play offense, not defense. I think we're always trying to slap the sins and smartphones and bad music out of teenagers' hands. I think it's time to let's mobilize this generation for the gospel and the Holy Spirit will help sanctify our students in the process. So let's let's go for it. You're so right, Greg, because I know as parents, sometimes we, again, walk this fine line of wanting to protect our children, our teens from the influences of the world. But, you know, if we have taken time and effort to pour the foundation of the gospel into them, why not release them? And we can we can only shelter them for so long <laughs> from those bad influences. Why not release them into the world as the messengers of Christ? Yeah, think about this. Babylon, right? Horrible place. Four teenagers, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, took a, what, a 900... A 900 mile, probably four month walk from Jerusalem to Babylon when they were, you know, deported. And you know that along the way, they were like, we're going to go in and we're going to turn this place upside down for God. And they resolved not to defile themselves. They, they stood when others bowed. They bowed when others stood. They see what others didn't and they did what others wouldn't. And, you know, they were public school kids, basically. They, you know, and and God used them to turn. I mean, literally, Nebuchadnezzar ended up putting his faith in God as a result of their testimony, and and their words. And so, why would we not do that? Jesus chose 
mostly teenagers. In Matthew 17, 24 through 27, Peter and Jesus and the disciples go into Capernaum, but only Peter and Jesus pay the temple tax. The temple tax was only for those 20 years old and older. So all the disciples are there, but only Peter and Jesus pay. That means Jesus was a youth leader with one adult volunteer and one rotten kid named Judas and no budget. And with that youth group, he changed the world. So why would we not mobilize, just like Jesus mobilized teenagers to change the world? Why aren't we mobilizing our youth groups? Why are we waiting until they're adults? I think we're losing them because we're not mobilizing them. We're teaching I them. I love it. Might. Yeah. So that's what we do at Dare to Share. We mobilize. Energize, mobilize, gospelize. Thank you, Greg, for this conversation and what you do for our teenagers, the generation that is coming up to take on the world. And uh, uh, we're definitely going to spread the word about the Dare to Share live event. And hopefully you will increase the numbers of teens attending. Thank you again and many blessings to you. To sum up the four fireproof principles that Greg outlined for us. Number one, choose love, not hate. Number two, choose the Bible, not the culture as the authority. Number three, choose the gospel instead of sin management. And number four, choose engagement, not detachment. If you think about these principles, they are a solid foundation for reaching a lost person for Christ. Not everyone will respond to your desire to help, but at the very least, you will plant the seed of what God's love looks like. And this is the highest accomplishment we can achieve in our Christian walk. I encourage you to check out Greg's website for some wonderful resources. Many of them are free, by the way. Uh, simply go to gregsteer.org. I will post a link in the show notes also so that you can easily reach it. If you feel called to fulfill the Great Commission and travel the world with the good news of Jesus, I encourage you to visit the website for World Missions Alliance, which is rfwma.org. There you will find opportunities to travel the world and help the hurting and the broken by sharing with them how Jesus changed your life. Again, our website is rfwma.org. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd. Limitless Spirit Podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.